Welcome to today's episode of the Simply Financial Podcast. I'm your host, Christopher Calandra. Want to increase your financial IQ with today's episode, which brings me to my guest, uh, Leonard or Lenny Orlaccio, who I've known for a number of years now, and he's been on this interesting pathway. Uh, You'll find out in this episode how he worked in corporate America and recently moved on from corporate America on to a new role, more entrepreneurial, small business oriented as uh, the next phase of his career on his way to retiring in a few years. So uh, Lenny, thanks for joining me today. Good morning, Chris. Thanks for having me on. So can you just give a quick description um, in the corporate world, um, what you were doing before um, changing gears? Sure. Yeah. I was with, uh, I was with uh, pharmaceutical companies in sales for 25 years uh, before I left. Um, Prior to that, I I had a number of different jobs. I was kind of floating around trying to find out uh, what I really wanted to do. I was in real estate actually before I got into pharmaceuticals. And then I had an opportunity through a friend uh, to get a job with a, with a big pharmaceutical company, you know, decent pay, decent benefits. And I made that move. And um, I was there for 25 years before I retired last year. Wow. All right, good. We're going to talk a little bit about that because I love, I love what you've done lifestyle wise. Also, we've talked about this at some length. Uh, about how you kind of planned it out, because I think it'll be um, instructive for people that are listening. Let's go back earlier, though, much earlier, if you will. I'm always curious about this. Can you tell us what kind of home you grew up in? Was it a wealthy home, poor, middle class? Uh, How would you characterize it? Um, I would say we started out poor uh, when I was very young, uh, moved around quite a bit from apartment to apartment, I'd say up until maybe I was in, you know, third or fourth grade, uh, changed schools quite a bit. And then from fourth grade on, I I believe, uh, we lived in a a, a more of a middle class neighborhood, Uh, were there for quite a while. And um, uh, we're doing better financially. So, uh, in, but in the beginning, poor, moved up to middle class, like I said, and then, you know, moved on to college and that type of thing. But growing up, it was a little bit of everything. I got a little All taste right. of both worlds. <laughs> Very good. And what did you learn about money when you were young? What are some of your earlier remembrances about money and what you learned about it? Well, like I said, when I was really young, we we didn't have a lot of money. So I think early on, I learned that I don't want to be like this with money. I want to have some money and be more comfortable. And I've always been always been frugal. And I don't know if it's because of you know how I grew up, but uh, I learned that uh, what I didn't want, what I wanted to be uh, financially at a very young age. And like I said, even as a young kid, I was frugal and I was kind of a penny pincher and I was careful of where I spent my allowance money. And I, I'd save my allowance money in my drawer. And until, until I saw something I really wanted. And even then, you know, it was tough to spend that money. (laughs) Yeah. So even to this day, you'd still would describe yourself as a, a frugal person is um, is that how Sue, your wife, would describe you? And is um, she more or less frugal than you? She's frugal, too. I, we're frugal, I think, in, in different ways. I think the bottom line is I think you can be frugal, but you want to be happy as well. So uh, we kind of work together to, to uh, you know, where do we want to spend money? Uh, we want to enjoy life. We don't want to sit back and not go out to dinner at a nice restaurant because we don't want to spend the money. Uh, I think I think uh, it's important to keep that in mind. You know, it's it's good to be frugal. It's good to save, but you want to enjoy your life too. So um, there's that that fine line you have to walk. Yeah, I love I love that concept. I am a big believer too, Lenny. And you know, we've talked about this. Is you need to strike a balance. You know, if you never spend any money, if you never enjoy anything and you're just saving and accumulating and building wealth for its own sake, you know, that could lack some satisfaction and, and, and not have enough joy and fulfillment in your life. So 
you need a balance. On the other end of the spectrum, you have met people as have I that live under the, you only live once and I'm not going to miss out and they just spend everything they make. And that has its own set of issues too. So you got to find someplace in the middle. Uh, so I, I like how you characterize that. And that lines up with, with my thinking, kind of my philosophy personally, as well as, you know, working in the practice here at LA Wealth Management. So let's get into what I alluded to at the, the top of the episode. You worked in corporate America, you described for 25 years, and uh, you recently left. Can you tell us about the decision to leave corporate America? This is a big decision, not just financially, but lifestyle-wise, emotionally. There's a lot that goes into this. Can you talk to us a little bit about that decision? Yeah, sure. It, it was, um, there were a couple reasons. Uh, I had been in it for 25 years. I was getting tired of it. The industry and my company was making changes that I really wasn't too crazy about. And then the biggest, uh, the biggest change came when they transferred my territory from Connecticut, which I had worked in this territory for the, for the, basically the 15 years I was with this particular company to move me to Massachusetts which was a really long commute. Oh, yeah. I wasn't familiar with the offices and the customers, kind of had to start all over again. And I did that for a year, and about halfway through it, I decided to start <laughs> doing some research and planning and seeing if I could hang it up after the end of that year. So I did all that research. I did all the planning, and uh, I was lucky enough that I, I, I did all the right things in the previous 25 years where I was lucky enough to be able to do that. And I think, correct me if I'm wrong, not everybody gets this opportunity, but you were able sort of to walk away from corporate America on your own terms. Like you chose the timing. You and I both know people that unfortunately they're downsized, they're let go, and then it may work out great for them, but but it's kind of thrust upon them and it could be unexpected and that means more stress. Mm -hmm. But that planning you talked about, and we're going to get into this a, a, in some detail, it must be nice that you did it on your own terms. Is, is that satisfying? Uh, it, was, it was great. I think all those years uh, previously of, of socking away money in, in my retirement accounts, instead of you know putting it in my own checking account and, in, and enjoying maybe it a little bit more, paid off when it was time for me to hang it up, I was lucky enough to have saved money and, and did well enough to be able to go out on my own terms. You decided this, um, I'm going to leave corporate America after your territory was changed from your home base state of Connecticut to Massachusetts, or was this idea already kind of percolating? Well, it was percolating, but it, it was accelerated by that move to Massachusetts. And, and gotcha. You know, I, I probably would have stayed on for a couple of more years if I had my old manager territory and I was in that comfort zone. But you know, in the industry, it, it's just really tough to go to another, to another, never mind another territory, but another state and have to pretty much learn everything all over again. And, and uh, I tried it and I had a good attitude, but I could tell that this just wasn't going to be what I wanted to do. Sure, sure. And so you decided when you leave corporate America, you retired from corporate America, but you knew that you were going to pivot to something else. Um, yeah. Did you decide you were going to leave corporate America and then try to figure out what would you would do next? Or did you already have a sense of what you were going to do next? And maybe we should just bring everybody in. What, what are you doing now? What was the role you entered into after leaving your sales job mm -hmm. in corporate mm -hmm. America? Yeah, I'm a full-time real estate agent. And that was, I'd say that was the plan for 25 years, really. I mean, I kept my license active for the 25 years I worked in corporate America. I still kept my hand in the business somewhat. Uh, I was what they call as a referral agent most of those years. I tried to do both for a little while, but it was just too much and it wasn't really fair to, to my clients. So I worked with another agent in the office. And uh, I was pretty much just a referral to them. I kept my continuing ed up. I took, uh, you know, paid my dues and kept in contact with all my real estate friends as well. So that was the plan all along that if okay. I ever got laid off, 
if I ever lost that job in in pharmaceutical sales, I always had that to fall back on, which I awesome. really, really enjoyed doing. Very good. Very good. So um, so you kind of knew what you were going to do. And then corporate America starts, you know, you, you're getting a little older, doing the same job, maybe a little less joy. I use that word a little bit ago. I think it's applicable here too. And then you get to change a territory and you're like, all right, I'm I, I need to make a change and then I could I could dedicate my time to doing real estate, which has been the plan all along. One of the things that I admire a lot about you and, and Sue also, but I, I think you did more of the heavy lifting planning. I know you guys really work as a team, husband and wife and, you know, good communication and all of that. But I, I think you did more of the nuts and bolts kind of planning is can you talk to us and you don't have to give out confidential information, but again, I think it's very educational because you did a really great job of planning the financial part of this change. Um, before we get into what you did, was that helpful? If you're giving advice to someone that's listening and thinking about making a career change like this, was the work you put into your planning worth it? How much did it help? Oh, it, it was tremendous. Yeah, I mean, uh, to to if I understand, I mean, uh, to get where I am today, what you're asking is the planning goes way back to when I was in real estate before pharmaceutical sales and um, the the whole saving process of for retirement. I mean, I've always been interested in in like I said in 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 the savings. A process and in and investing. I actually had a, a stint with a bank as a lot for a while back right after college and uh, worked as a teller. So I, I got to know a lot about money and lending and things like that. And um, I think that uh, I've always been uh, educating myself, reading books, reading articles, magazines, newspapers. And uh, it it was always in the back of my mind of what I need to do to be comfortable, say, 25 or 30 years down the road so I can retire. And I, what you said is pretty much right on. I, that's pretty much what my job is in our relationship is I'll take care of the, the finance and, and retirement savings that Sue didn't really have any interest in that. So the planning, I can't stress enough. I mean, the earlier you are, the better to start planning as early as you can for 30 years down the road. Yes, well said. One element to this planning for this change was was important is that you, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, you set aside a certain amount of money, certain accounts, and identified that as your bridge fund. Mm -hmm. When I'm working with um, clients in my practice, my role, Lenny, as a certified financial planner, we talk about, you know, you want to have an emergency fund, you want to have a retirement account, you might want to have a college fund, you might be uh, saving money towards a down payment. You use that same strategy, identifying money specifically for this change, this important change, and identifying a bridge account. And I think that was so smart and so well executed. Can you explain what the bridge account was and, and how it has been beneficial to you as you, you're working through this change? Yeah, yeah. Without the bridge account, I, I would not have been able to retire when I did. So, and I didn't set it up until really late in my career. I would say once my once my youngest daughter graduated college and I wrote that last tuition check out, that money that we spent on college, I would sock away as much as I could. And I had a, a, a goal in mind to put aside so that if I have if I really want to retire when I'm say 60, 61. Um, I'd be able to pay myself out of that bridge account until it's time to start either collecting social security or withdrawing from my retirement accounts. And uh, it was definitely vital to do that. And um, nothing ever works out perfectly. Unexpected expenses come up. But if you have that bridge account and it's significant, it just makes life so much easier and you sleep so much better at night. And really without that, I, I I probably would still be working in pharmaceuticals off that bridge account and be less happy. Oh, I'd be, I'd be much less happy. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to say miserable, but that might be a stretch. <laughs> and maybe you don't want to admit that on air. So you continue to fund your other priorities like saving for retirement, but you took this other cash flow that was going towards college tuition and you set that aside 
And some of it was invested. Some of it was bank savings. It was kind of a diversified strategy. But that money was earmarked to help through the transition because I believe this is accurate, is that when you left corporate America and started real estate, um, you didn't make the same amount of money right away in real estate um, because you needed to kind of build up momentum in real estate. Clients, mm -hmm. you know, dedicate the time to kind of build that back up. So then you would use the bridge money to provide income if you need to, because you were going to make less at the very least during the early stages of the transition, because real estate agent work can be very profitable, high paying work, but you don't turn it on and off like a light switch, right? No, you don't. And it's, it's very sporadic. You know, my, I, I, I had goals for what I would make the first year, what I'll make this year. Um, it's, it's, it's pretty much uh, honestly a fraction of what I made in my previous job, but I knew that going into it, it takes years to build up a good real estate business. And at the age I'm at, I don't know that I'll ever get to the level I was, um, as a top producer, but, um, uh, you know, the, the, the energy and the, in the, and the drive to try to do that is there. But the goal is that if I don't get to that level, if I get to a fraction of that level, well, I still have the bridge account and it should last up until my goal is say 65 when I can really make the decision, do I want to retire fully or do I want to keep doing this? And um, I want to be able to make, like go out on my own terms again at 65. Yeah, that's a great goal. So, you alluded to this before when you when you retired from corporate America it was in early 2022, right? Mm -hmm. How old were you? I was 61. Okay. All right, good. So not only did the bridge account provide the financial resources to fill in income if you need, given that it was going to decline, but I imagine a lot of what we're talking about, it's a recurring theme is kind of put it on your terms and the flexibility that you could not feel pressure to do the real estate agent because you had that backing. I imagine that whole thing, whether you touch the money or not, just gives you peace and allow you to build your real estate agent business the right way because you don't have the need to do a deal to pay your mortgage this month. That's absolutely right. And that, and I thought about that going into it. Um, if it doesn't work, um, it's not like I'm in a lot of trouble. It could help stretch out my bridge account. Um, it could help me, you know, make that decision at 65 much easier, but it's not absolutely 100% necessary. And going into it, that gives you a, a great comfort level. It doesn't mean I, I don't work hard. I still, it's just in my, it's, I just have that drive to work hard in the business, but there's not yes. that pressure of having to feed the kids. Uh, they're all out of the house. It's just me and Sue. So um, there's a lot less pressure than there was when I did this a long time ago. <laughs> yeah. So thank you for sharing that part of your journey. Uh, again, um, compliments to you and to Sue. Um, so well done. You may not feel like it, right? But I, I think you're a good model for people to emulate. You've been successful in your career, as has Sue, mm -hmm. and you've been successful in transitioning your career. Um, you've built wealth. Now you, you know, again, we're not giving out personal information. You're, you're not a multi-billionaire, but you, you've done well for yourself. Let's just leave it at that. Um, you've alluded to some of this already, but what are some of your rules on handling money? You already said about being frugal, which by extension means living beneath your means, right? You right. consistently saved and put money away to build wealth, increase your nest egg. That's one rule. Are there any others you could um, point out for us? I, one of my big rules, and this has been a rule my whole life is, and it's, it sounds simple, but pay your credit card off every month. I think if, you, if you're spending more than you really should be to try to keep up with the Joneses, you're going to find yourself in big trouble. I've seen it happen too many times with, with people I know very close to me who just go overboard. And, and the one rule that Sue and I have always had is, don't pay a penny interest on a credit card bill. Don't spend, don't go, don't live beyond your means. Uh, that's the, that's the one thing that I've always said our whole life. The other, the other is, you know, save for retirement, uh, whether it's a company that will contribute to a 401k, 
it's never too late. I didn't start really saving for retirement until I was in my 30s. That's yeah, I, I really surprising. didn't. So, uh, you know, if, if you don't have a penny saved for retirement and you're in your 30s and you start thinking, well, it's just, you know, too late. I'll never get what I need. That's not true. So it's so big to put as much as you can in that 401k or in that SEP IRA or whatever retirement vessel you use uh, as early as you can, but also it's never too late. And I try to teach that to my daughter. So I don't know if they're listening or not when, when I yeah. tell them, but we'll, we'll, you know. we'll, we'll, we'll send them this episode when it gets released and uh, they could listen and there know you that go. you're talking to everyone, including them. So, you know, you talked about those rules and, and I think you said something to the effect of it's your whole life or the entirety of your marriage. I find that as people get older and they have success and they get knocked around, mistakes, setbacks, missteps, all of that, that sometimes their views on money change. I, I know it's the same for me. I'm 52 years old now and I've been immersed in financial planning my whole career, you know, my, my views have changed. Uh, there's an evolution. Some of it's technology and the world changes, but some of it's just, you know, you might become a little wiser. Have any of your views on money changed over the years? I don't, I don't think so, Chris. I think no? I've always been, you know, I've always been a, a saver. Mm -hmm. uh, I've always had that goal in mind that I, I don't want to be working because I have to when I'm 70. It's just dollar cost average. That was always what I, I yeah. thought of all through all my working years. And, um, you know, I try to think of how my, how my views on money have changed. You know, it's, you know, it's just stay educated on what's going on, really. I mean, yeah, um, I don't think they've changed in all these years. I think I'm pretty much the same as I was years ago. All right. Very good. How about notable money mistakes. You know, I've had a great conversation with you um, during this episode. You and I have talked about all of this stuff at um, at length over the last couple of years and dug into it pretty good. And so somebody listening might be like, oh, you know, it's just been perfect. Like everything has gone great and made good decisions and smart and these rules and uh, planned out this career change. Like everything is perfect. I imagine there might have been some missteps along the way. Any notable money mistakes you want to share with us? Yeah, I mean, I've made I've made plenty of mistakes. Um, you know, there there were you know bad investments I've made in businesses. Uh, you know, trying to open my own business with my with my siblings um, years ago, which failed. I lost money doing that. I always think about, boy, if I put that money in, a, in an account and, and didn't touch it, I'd be really <laughs> well off now. But it was a big mistake. I didn't, I, I got into something I didn't know a lot about and, uh, yeah. you know, uh, thought I could make it work. It didn't work. Um, bad investments, thinking I was a, <laughs> thinking, thinking I knew, uh, and, and I did do some due diligence when purchasing stocks, but before I started using financial people, I tried to do it on my own. And found that you know I'm really, I'm really just breaking even here, mm -hmm. uh, making some good decisions, making some bad decisions as far as you know picking stocks and uh, thinking I can do that all on my own, it just didn't work out for me. And I, I came to the realization early on that I'm I'm just really not good at this. So, mm -hmm. uh, and you know what? It started keeping you up at night. Even at a young age, I was thinking, oh my god, look at how much I lost. I can't right. do with this. And right, right. So, so what? What I you know I I. I just think I just, um, you know, and I have friends that are really good at it, but I sure. just was never good at it. And yeah. I just had to come to that realization and and move on. And I was very lucky enough that I realized it early enough in life and just let the let the professionals handle it. And I sleep much better at night. So, well said. Um, yeah. Well know said. what you're so, good at. Know what you're not good at. Yeah, that's great advice, financial and otherwise. Wonderful. Um, last question. You've said a couple of times you're frugal, you're not a free spender, but is there something that you do splurge on? Golf. Golf? Yeah, golf. I I, I spend money on golf. Yeah, I, and sometimes I, and and I have to say uh, I'm a I'm a uh, big photography hobbyist as well, and I I even do some uh, some professional shoots for people, but I don't really advertise it or anything like that but i will spend money on 
on good camera equipment and good golf equipment and I'll spend money to play nice golf courses. That's my big splurge really. Yeah. Very good. Good. Thank you for sharing. And I, I so appreciate you, uh, your openness and genuineness talking to me today, sharing a little bit of your story. Mm -hmm. uh, I know for a lot of people, they don't like to talk about themselves. And I think you especially are very humble, but um, this is this is good stuff and uh, I think valuable. So thanks for taking the time and uh, being so open. I appreciate no, it a lot. No, thanks for having me on, Chris. And yes. uh, I really appreciate it. It was, uh, you know, maybe maybe somebody will get something out of this. There you go. <laughs> I think so. So listeners, I'll be back with you on the next episode of the Simply Financial Podcast very soon. In the meantime, go to my site, elliotwealth.com. You could find more information about me and the team here at Elliott Wealth Management, how we help our clients win with money. And I always ask too, if you haven't already, please subscribe to the podcast, the Simply Financial Podcast. Thanks again. The views expressed are not necessarily the opinion of Sage Point Financial Incorporated and should not be construed directly or indirectly as an offer to buy or sell any securities mentioned herein. Investing is subject to risks, including loss of principal invested. Past performance is not a guarantee of future results. No strategy can assure a profit nor protect against loss. Please note that individual situations can vary. Therefore, the information should be relied upon when coordinated with individual professional advice. Please note the information being provided is strictly as a courtesy. When you link to any of the websites provided here, you are leaving this website. We make no representation as to the completeness or accuracy of the information provided at these websites, nor is the company liable for any direct or indirect technical or system issues or any consequences arising out of your access to your use of third-party technologies websites, information, and programs made available through this website. When you access one of these websites, you are leaving our website and assume total responsibility and risk for your use of the websites you are linking to. Securities and advisory services are offered through Sage Point Financial Incorporated, member FINRA SIPC, insurance services offered through Elliott Wealth Management, LLC, not affiliated with Sage Point Financial.